treatment plans for pain. After a thorough assessment and any diagnostic tests, a comprehensive pain treatment plan should be developed and customized to the needs of the individual patient. The treatment plan should include the treatment goals, the types of therapies planned, and an explanation of the roles and responsibilities of the patient and healthcare team. The goals of treatment should be based on 1. Expected outcomes of pain reduction 2. Improvement in functional outcomes impaired by pain and 3. Quality of life When creating treatment plans for patients with pain, it is important to focus on both physician and patient goals. A recent study found that physicians rated improvement in function as the top goal for their patients with pain. This study stressed the importance of physicians discussing treatment goals with their patients during the patient's visit. Additionally, it has been found that patients accept treatment plans developed by their physicians if there is a positive physician patient relationship. A multimodal treatment plan can include non-pharmacologic and or, or pharmacologic approaches. Multimodal pain management includes four models of treatment plans. 1. Cognitive behavioral therapy. 2. Physical treatments. 3. Pharmacotherapy. 4. Interventional treatments. Under multimodal treatment plan, as we discussed earlier we are concentrating on four goals, one pain reduction, two restoring the function, three improving the quality of life, four cultivate well-being. Now if we let's see how these models are going to fulfill or we can say complete the goals decided. Cognitive behavioral therapy and physical treatment together will work for the pain reduction, while physical treatment and pharmacotherapy will restore the function. Quality of life will be improved by pharmacotherapy and interventional treatments, and cognitive behavioral therapy with interventional treatment plans will cultivate well-being. So we have seen that how this multi-model treatment plan have fulfilled our goals of treatment. But each model has methods and each methods have its own benefits over others. So for a clinician it becomes really difficult to decide which therapy plan should be followed. Today in this session we will discuss that which therapy plan should be followed for which type of patients. Evidence-based non-pharmacologic treatments, pain can occur from a variety of causes. Regardless of pain type, non-pharmacologic treatment approaches should always be considered. Non-pharmacologic approaches have been found to be effective alone or as part of a comprehensive pain management plan, particularly for musculoskeletal pain and chronic pain. It is important to note that not all non-pharmacologic treatment options have the same strength of evidence to support their use in the management of pain, and some may be more applicable for certain conditions than others. There is some evidence that practicing CACHI may be of benefit in patients with back pain, knee pain, and fibromyalgia. Research shows that practicing a carefully adapted set of yoga poses also may be beneficial for reducing pain and improving function in patients with chronic low back pain. Other non-pharmacologic treatments that have been used in the management of pain include CBT, ACT, acupuncture, occupational therapy, physical therapy, aquatic therapy, mindfulness meditation, osteopathic manipulation therapy, and surgical or neuromodulation therapies. Pharmacologic treatments, 
Prescribers do not have to have in-depth knowledge of every available product, but they must be experts on the ones that they prescribe. This means being knowledgeable about the drug substance, formulation, strength, dosing interval, key instructions, specific information about conversion, drug interactions, use in opioid-tolerant patients, product-specific safety concerns, and relative potency to morphine. Different types of pain require different types of treatment. Prescribers should consider all pain management options and prescribe opioids only when non-opioid options are inadequate and when the benefits of using an opioid are expected to outweigh the risks. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines recommend assessing the type of pain the patient is experiencing, determining whether to treat the patient's pain with non-pharmacologic and or pharmacologic treatments, and to regularly reassess the pain the patient is experiencing to determine if a change in the treatment regimen is needed. If we observe the pharmacological pain management strategies it will slightly differ for each types of pain. As in last session we learned that there are different types of pain and they have different origin. So they have different pharmacological treatment strategies. However there is no such huge difference between the treatment plans. But one plan can have benefit over other for particular types of pain. If we see nociceptive or inflammatory and neuropathic pain, both have almost same treatment plans but if we observe the nociplastic pain, we should avoid opioids. Whatever is the pharmacological treatment plan non-pharmacological treatment plan should be included with that. Now we know that for what type of pain opioids should be given but the challenge with us is that either opioid should be given for that particular patient. As we have seen in our previous session that there is huge chance of opioid abuse in patients. The use of opioids for the management of pain should be considered only after the patient has failed to adequately respond to non-pharmacologic and non-opioid interventions. The potential benefits of using an opioid are likely to outweigh the risks, and the patient has moderate to severe neuropathic or nociceptive pain. So it becomes necessary to assess risk of opioid misuse or abuse. For patients receiving opioid therapy, there are a variety commonly used tools to assess risk of misuse or abuse. There is no single screening instrument that can be used to reliably predict patients who are not suitable candidates for opioid therapy. A combination of strategies is recommended to stratify risk, identify and understand aberrant drug-related behaviors, and tailor treatments accordingly. For all patients who are being considered for an opioid trial, should be assist with the Opioid Risk Tool, OTOUD, Screener and Opioid Assessment for Patients with Pain, SOAP, or Diagnosis, Intractability, Risk, and Efficacy Score, DIA, Tool to Assess Abuse Potential. OTOUD should be used before first-time opioid treatment. Under this tool we ask questions based on three section. 1. Family. 2. Personal. 3. Psychological. We ask that either patient or patient's family have any of the following. 1. Alcohol abuse. 2. Illegal drug abuse or. 3. Prescription Drug Abuse Then we ask regarding psychological health of patient. Either patient have any depression or ADD, OCD or bipolar disorders. 
Under this tool we also see the age of patient either he or she is between age of 16 to 45. As this age group is more vulnerable for drug abuses so it is necessary to take care of this. In above assessment tool, whichever question gets answer in yes, consider one score for that question. If the score is 2 or less then chance of drug use disorder is very less. But if score comes 3 or more than 3 the chance if abuse becomes high. Examples of pretreatment risk assessment tools. Tool features opioid risk tool, ORTOUD, modification of original ORT, self-administered, includes nine items. Assesses risk of aberrant drug-related behaviors. Assesses risk of OUD development in patients with CNMP on LTOT. Screener and opioid assessment for patients with pain, SOAPP, usually self-administered in waiting room, exam room, or prior to an office visit, may be completed as part of an interview with a nurse, physician, or psychologist, includes 24, 14, and 5 items, for different formats available. Assesses risk of aberrant drug-related behaviors may be particularly useful in high-risk settings. Diagnosis, intractability, risk, and efficacy score, DIRE, administered by clinician, includes seven items. Assesses potential efficacy as well as harms. OUD is equal to opioid use disorder. CNMP is equal to chronic non-malignant pain, LTOT is equal to long-term opioid therapy. For patients with a history of substance use disorder, or if misuse or abuse is suspected, one or more of the following tools should be used. 1. Cut down, annoyed, guilty, eye-opener tool, adapted to include drugs, Gage, aid, two. Relax, alone, friends, family, trouble, raft, three. Drug abuse screening test, DAST, four. Childhood trauma questionnaire, CTQ, and adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. A history of substance use disorder does not preclude patients from receiving treatment with an opioid analgesic. However, additional monitoring and consultation with or referral to an expert may be required. Like other drug treatment opioid also have some side effects, and that become an important sector to be taken care of. Prior to initiating an opioid, patients should be informed of the potential side effects and adverse effects. Opioid-induced constipation is the most common side effect associated with the use of opioid therapy. For patients who experience opioid-induced constipation, prescribers should initiate mitigation strategies, like laxatives and increasing fluids to alleviate this side effect other side effects associated with opioid use include nausea or vomiting sedation cognitive impairment myoclonus allergic reactions sweating meiosis urinary retention hypogonadism hyperalgesia tolerance and physical dependence. Opioid-induced respiratory depression can be a life-threatening situation. It can occur in patients who are opioid-naive or just underwent an increase in their opioid dose. Opioid-induced respiratory depression can also occur in elderly, cachectic, or debilitated patients, 
and opioid use is contraindicated in patients with respiratory depression or conditions that increase risk of respiratory depression, like obstructive sleep apnea. The risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression is particularly high in patients who are taking opioids in combination with benzodiazepines. The use of benzodiazepines in combination with opioids can also result in overdose or death, and, therefore, should be avoided whenever possible. In rare circumstances, Benzodiazepines can be used in patients receiving opioid therapy with extreme caution. The risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression can be reduced by ensuring the proper dosing and titration of an opioid, not overestimating the dose when converting from another opioid product, and instructing patients to swallow their opioid tablets capsules whole. Patients should be instructed to never cut, crush, dissolve, or chew the opioid tablets capsules because it may be fatal, particularly for opioid-naive individuals. Educate patients and their family members about signs and symptoms opioid-induced respiratory depression and how to seek help, when necessary. Consider co-prescribing naloxone in patients receiving opioid therapy in the event of an emergent situation. Patients and their family members should also be educated about other risks associated with opioid use. Transdermal formulations should not be used if the patch is cut or damaged the entire film should be used. Exposure to External heat for example, hot tubs, hot baths and showers, and working exercising in high temperatures, can result in quicker absorption of the patch, and may lead to a fatal overdose. Patients with a fever should be monitored for signs or symptoms of increased opioid exposure. Adverse effects that can occur with opioid use include falls or fractures, hospitalization, disability or permanent damage, addiction, overdose, and death. Apart from side effects, interaction with other drugs is major challenge in front of healthcare professionals. For safer opioid use, prescribers should be aware of the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and drug interactions associated with each opioid analgesic. For example, the use of opioids with monoamine oxidase inhibitors may increase respiratory depression or can cause serotonin syndrome. Opioid use can also reduce the efficacy of diuretics, inducing the release of antidiuretic hormone. It should also be noted that many drugs can affect the metabolism of opioid analgesics, causing them to stay in the body too long or exit the body too rapidly. 40 to 50 percent of all medications, including opioids, like morphine, hydromorphone, oxymorphone, tapentadol, are metabolized through the CYP450 enzyme system. Opioids that are metabolized primarily through the CYP3A4 and or, or the CYP2D6 enzyme systems, like codeine, tramadol, oxycodone, hydrocodone, methadone, fentanyl, buprenorphine, are more likely to have drug-drug interactions with commonly prescribed drugs that are metabolized through the CYP450 system. These commonly prescribed drugs include selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, steroids, certain statins, macrolide antibiotics, benzodiazepines, and warfarin. Additionally, 
Drugs that inhibit CYP enzymes can increase the blood levels of some opioids, while drugs that induce CYP enzymes lower the blood levels of other opioids. Prescribers should be aware of the CYP enzyme pathway of the opioid prescribed to the patient, like CYP450, CYP2D6, CYP3A4, as well as the CYP enzyme pathway of other medications taken by the patient to ensure that the patient is receiving the proper amount of the opioid analgesic. Prescribers should be aware of the more common drug-drug interactions when prescribing opioids. The use of opioids with other central nervous system depressants, like benzodiazepines, can increase the risk of respiratory depression, hypotension, profound sedation, or coma. Enhanced neuromuscular blocking action and increased respiratory depression may occur with concurrent use of opioids and skeletal muscle relaxants. Concurrent use of opioids with partial agonists, egg, buprenorphine, or mixed agonist antagonists, egg, pentazosine, nalbufin, butafenol, may result in reduced analgesic effect and or precipitate symptoms of withdrawal. The use of opioids with anticholinergic medication increases the risk of urinary retention and severe constipation, which may lead to paralytic ileus. Till now we discuss treatment pattern in general population, but when we move for the treatment in special population there is need to do slight change in management plan. On the basis of the absorption rate, elimination rate, or metabolic activity, the action of opioid will differ. Opioid therapy may be an appropriate part of a multimodal treatment plan for older patients if they are properly selected and monitored. More cautious initiation and titration of opioid therapy is warranted in older persons. Patients should be monitored closely, especially when initiating and titrating therapy and when patients are taking other drugs that depress respiration. Older patients also may have medical problems that increase the risk of opioid-related side effects, such as respiratory depression. Opioid-related bowel dysmotility may be enhanced in older patients, so routine initiation of a bowel regimen is recommended before the development of constipation. The starting dose should be reduced to one-third to one-half of the usual dosage in debilitated, non-opioid-tolerant patients, and the dose should be titrated cautiously, start low and go slow. It is also important to assess whether the patient or caregiver will be able to manage the opioid therapy responsibly. The management of persistent pain in pregnant women can be challenging because of the risks to the mother and the fetus. The potential risks of opioid therapy to the newborn include premature birth, low birth weight, small for gestational age, sudden infant death, reduced head circumference, neurodevelopmental impairments, congenital malformations, Neonatal Opioid Withdrawal Syndrome Clinicians should be aware of the pregnancy status of their patients who may receive opioids and counsel women of childbearing potential about the risks and benefits of opioid therapy during pregnancy and after delivery. Minimal or no use of opioids during pregnancy should be encouraged unless the potential benefits outweigh the risks. As part of obstetric care, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends universal drug screening for substance use at the first prenatal visit.
For women who are currently on chronic opioid therapy and are pregnant or who are thinking of becoming pregnant, the use of methadone maintenance treatment is recommended over continued use of chronic opioid therapy or detoxification from opioid therapy because of the risk of relapse and its potential risks to the fetus. The dosage of methadone is managed by an addiction treatment specialist within a registered opioid treatment program, in communication with the patient's obstetric team. When it comes for the treatment in children and adolescents, the safety and effectiveness of most opioids in children younger than 18 years have not been established and most of these agents are not indicated for children. An exception is transdermal fentanyl, which is approved in opioid tolerant children ages 2 years and older, and oxycodone ER, which is approved in opioid tolerant children ages 11 years and older. ER la opioid analgesics are primarily indicated for children with life-limiting conditions. Extrapolation of adult doses based on an MGKG approach leads to overdosing in some pediatric populations and underdosing in others, due to age-related and developmental changes in pharmacokinetics. When prescribing opioids to children for chronic pain, pediatric palliative care teams or pediatric pain specialists should be consulted. Or these patients should be treated at a specialized multidisciplinary pain clinic. Other patient populations in which care should be taken when prescribing opioids analgesics include patients with sleep disorders, sleep disordered breathing issues, dementia, renal or hepatic impairment, psychiatric conditions, and patients who are at the end of their life. Sleep disorders Approximately two-thirds of patients with chronic pain suffer from poor or non-refreshing sleep due to a mutually reinforcing relationship between these two conditions. The issue with pain and sleep is complicated opioid analgesics can disrupt the sleep cycle, causing fragmented sleep. When patients experience poor sleep due to pain, they are more likely to experience pain the following night, leading to a vicious cycle. Chronic pain is often associated with a sleep-wake disorder, and treating these coexisting issues can be difficult and problematic. Diagnosis of a sleep-wake disorder is made through a comprehensive assessment that includes a detailed patient history, physical examination, questionnaires, sleep diaries, and sleep studies. After the sleep study, patients should follow up with a specialist to review the outcomes and develop a treatment plan. Sleep disordered breathing issues The use of opioid analgesics in patients with sleep disorders or sleep apnea or in patients who are morbidly obese with sleep apnea or a history of snoring places them at a higher risk of over-sedation or respiratory depression. Patients on long-term opioid therapy should be advised to reduce their daily opioid dose, particularly the evening dose by at least 30 percent when they are experiencing an upper respiratory tract infection or asthmatic episode dementia the use of opioid analgesics in patients with sleep disorders or sleep apnea or in patients who are morbidly obese with sleep apnea or a history of snoring places them at a higher risk of over sedation or respiratory depression Patients on long-term opioid therapy should be advised to reduce their daily opioid dose, particularly the evening dose, by at least 30% when they are experiencing an upper respiratory tract infection or asthmatic episode. Psychiatric disorders Psychiatric disorders, like severe depression, anxiety disorders, 
bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and substance abuse disorders often are comorbid conditions. This co-occurrence is frequently under-recognized and under-treated, resulting in poor outcomes. Substance use disorders and mental illnesses have many of the same risk factors. Additionally, having a mental illness may predispose a person to develop a substance abuse disorder and vice versa. Treatment should focus on both the psychiatric disorder and the substance abuse disorder together, rather than treating one or the other as it has been found that failure to treat one disorder negatively affects the longitudinal course of the other disorder and severity of the illness. Substance use and addiction can contribute to the development of psychotic symptoms. Examples include cocaine-induced psychosis, phencyclidine-induced psychosis, and psychosis induced by heavy or long-term methamphetamine or alcohol use, which can last for weeks or months. Long-term substance use may change the brain in ways that make a person more likely to develop a mental illness. Therefore, following withdrawal of the drug, it is important to evaluate the person for an underlying medical or mental illness. In patients receiving opioids for pain and SSRIs, SRNIs, or tricyclic antidepressants for depression or another mental disorder, prescribers need to be aware of drug interactions and the development of serotonin syndrome. In the presence of other serotonergic agents, opioids may significantly affect serotonin kinetics, causing increased intrasynaptic serotonin levels, which can lead to the development of serotonin syndrome. In March 2016, the Food and Drug Administration issued a warning about the potential interaction between opioids and antidepressants and the development of serotonin syndrome. Patients may also be taking benzodiazepines, which in combination with an opioid, can cause respiratory depression. Hepatic impairment The liver is the primary site of biotransformation from parent opioid compounds to active or inactive metabolites. Increased opioid toxicity can occur in patients with hepatic impairment due to cirrhosis of the liver. These patients often develop gastritis, gastrointestinal tract ulcers, or portal hypertensive gastropathy, along with delayed gastric emptying, which can lead to delayed drug absorption. In patients with cirrhosis, it is recommended that IR opioids be prescribed instead of delayed, sustained or ER formulations and to initiate IR opioid therapy at the lowest dose and titrate slowly to achieve efficacy. Renal impairment can occur from mild to moderate liver disease. Glomerular filtration, tubular secretion, and tubular absorption affect renal excretion of opioids. Predictions of the renal excretion of medications are made by estimating the glomerular filtration rate. The creatinine clearance may also be used to make renal adjustments for medications. Information on the use of specific opioid in patients with hepatic and renal impairment can be found in the prescribing information. End of life situations in end of life situations. Involvement of a hospice and palliative medicine specialist should be considered early. Clinicians should carefully evaluate whether improvement in function is feasible in light of the underlying condition and prognosis, even with optimal pain management. If functional improvement is not a goal of care, clinicians should document what goals are desired and achievable. Egg. 
comfort sufficient to be aware of friends and family or whether comfort with sedation is acceptable. Misuse or diversion of opioid medications is less likely to be a problem for the patient, but should be monitored among caregivers. Managing patients on opioid analgesics. According to the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, when initiating opioid therapy, begin with IAR opioids and prescribe at the lowest effective dose. Caution should be used when prescribing any opioid. However, particular caution should be taken when increasing the opioid dose to greater than or equal to 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day. When titrating the opioid dose to greater than or equal to 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day, the decision should be carefully justified. Opioid analgesics should only be prescribed for the expected duration of pain. For acute pain, three days of opioid therapy will often be sufficient, with treatment lasting no longer than seven days. For longer-term pain, the risks and benefits of opioid therapy should be re-evaluated within one to four weeks of initiation or dose escalation. Thereafter, prescribers should re-evaluate the risks and benefits of opioid therapy every three months. If the benefits do not outweigh the harms, Prescribers should optimize other therapies and work with patients to taper the opioid therapy to a lower dose or discontinue the opioid therapy. Patients should always be provided with dosing instructions, including the maximum daily dose. For patients taking higher doses of opioids, that is greater than or equal to 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day, or with a history of overdose or substance abuse disorder, prescribers should incorporate strategies to mitigate risk into the management plan, such as co-prescribing naloxone. When prescribing opioids, it is also important for prescribers to keep in mind that there may be an inter-individual variability of response among patients. Ongoing and long-term management periodically review the patient's progress toward functional goals. Is progress being made? If not, reset the goals if necessary or indicated and develop reasonable expectations. At each visit, review says A's the patient may be experiencing, including evaluating bowel function, screening for endocrine function as needed, reporting adverse effects to the FDA website, and implementing opioid rotation as indicated. When clinically indicated or legally mandated, clinicians should check the PDMP to ensure that the patient is receiving the opioid dose or determine if the patient is taking dangerous combinations that increase the risk of overdose. PDMP data should be reviewed with initiating opioid therapy for chronic pain and then periodically during treatment, like every three months or with every prescription. Clinicians should use UDT before prescribing opioid therapy and consider UDT at least annually to assess for prescribed medications, as well as other controlled prescription drugs and illicit drugs. Patients should be monitored for adherence to the treatment plan using medication reconciliation, egg, pill counts, along with evaluation for non-adherence. Throughout pain management, clinicians should monitor patients for both pain control and any suspected substance abuse, and document both. Many. Clinicians use the 5 A's for pain, along with the 5 C's for substance use disorder, for monitoring and documentation.
When to switch from IAR to ER la opioids the primary reasons to switch from an IAR formulation to an ER la formulation of an opioid include to maintain steady state plasma levels of the opioid, a longer duration of action, multiple IAR doses often needed to achieve effective analgesia, poor analgesic efficacy despite dose titration, and less sleep disruption. Other reasons for switching to an ER la opioid include the patient's desire or need to try a new formulation, cost or insurance issues, adherence issues, a change in clinical status requiring an opioid with different pharmacokinetics, or problematic drug-drug interactions. ER la opioids Dose selection when changing from an IAR to an ER la opioid, the drug and dose selection are critical. Some ER la opioids or dosage forms are only recommended for opioid tolerant patients, egg, any strength of transdermal fentanyl, hydromorphone ER, 